Welcome everyone. If you just give me one minute, um, I just want to make sure technically we're all set and then we'll get started. Okay, great. Um, I assume you can hear me and welcome everyone. Um, this is uh, our first uh, lecture in a, in a larger series. Um, this series is called Global Social Theory. Uh, my name is Julian Goh, and I'm a professor of sociology here at Chicago and the organizer and convener of this series. Um, let me just start with a note of thanks. Um, the series is sponsored by the University of Chicago's Global Studies Program. Um, and, I, and I'd like to thank that program for making that possible. Um, and especially uh, the director of the program, Professor Kimberly K. Huang, um, and who's also my colleague here in sociology. And I'd also like to thank the team at Global Studies, Lee Price and Brian Fanati. Uh, they've been an immense help and, and this simply wouldn't have been possible without them. Um, so regarding our event today, uh, I'm just gonna briefly introduce the series uh, before introducing our speaker. And hopefully after uh, Professor Connell's talk, we'll have time for questions and discussion. So first the series, um, as you probably know, um, this is just the beginning. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite a few more. Um, and the series in turn is an offshoot of my course here at the University of Chicago titled Global Social Theory. Um, I should say something about the premise of the course and, and of the series. Um, the premise is relatively straightforward. And that is that um, for too long, social science, uh, especially, but not necessarily only in North America, has been dominated by a relatively narrow set of uh, thinkers, theorists, standpoints for understanding the social world, representing a relatively narrow set of experiences, and that therefore a more global orientation to theory is warranted. Um, and global here is not only, if at all, referring to geographic scope, scale or representation, but also to a capaciousness, a sense of wider inclusion and openness to alternative standpoints, concepts, and theories that have been repressed, marginalized, or occluded by dominant theoretical perspectives and the imperial episteme to which so many of those perspectives are tethered. Um, and it seems to me that this project is all the more urgent today at a time when social scientific knowledge and social theory appear to many to be out of pace with the events and problems in the world today. Of course, all kinds of questions uh, are opened up with this project, right? What is the history that has generated this current state of epistemic inequality and the epistemic erasure of alternative standpoints and theories? Um, what exactly are these alternative standpoints or theories? What is the criteria for inclusion and by implication exclusion? What's the epistemic warrant for bringing in some rather than others? Um, does critiquing dominant social scientific frameworks and seeking out new ones necessarily entail a rejection of science altogether? Um, what would that look like? And what are the current global inequalities in knowledge production that impede us from realizing the project and that might be perpetuating epistemic inequalities in our institutions of knowledge? These are uh, live questions, they are ongoing. Um, and I hope that the lecture series offers one space in which at least some of these questions and many others can be discussed. Um, and so the series is really, I think, part of a larger conversation, which has in fact been going on for some time across the social sciences around the world. And so we stand on the shoulders of, of those who have already brought up these issues. Um, one of those thinkers, of course, uh, who has been crucial for opening up these conversations and this project is our guest today, Professor Raywin Connell. Um, in many ways, Professor Connell needs no introduction and frankly, to try to introduce her would take up the entire time. Um, so let me just say um, that Professor Connell, who is now Professor Emerita at the University of Sydney, has consistently raised provocative questions and offered invaluable insights into matters of social inequality and power around the world. Uh, her earliest work on class structure, such as in her books, Ruling Class, Ruling Culture, and Class Structure in Australian History, um, to her uh, work on class and gender in schools, such as the books, Making the Difference and Teacher's Work, to her uh, other work uh, on gender and power and gender in rural perspective, and of course, her masterful work titled Masculinities. Throughout all this work, uh, Professor Connell has, has really uh, opened up all, sites of new in all kinds of new insights 
for us. Um, uh, more recently, Professor Connell has been engaging in the questions that I've just raised about global social theory and epistemic inequality, and indeed, to my mind, has been largely responsible for opening them up in the first place. Um, and her work along these lines include many articles and, of course, her book, Southern Theory, which to my mind is probably one of the most important books, if not the most important book in social theory in the past two decades, at least. Um, and I don't exaggerate. Um, and on a personal note for me, uh, that book has been an immense revelation um, and for me and my students over the years. So I can't thank uh, Raywin enough for that work and related work. And of course, I owe her a deep thanks for joining us today, despite the fact that it is so, so painfully early there in Australia where she is currently located. Um, so uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Connell and I'll turn things over to her. Thank you very much, Julian. <clears throat> I hope I'm coming through clearly. Uh, I have a slightly um, improvised setup here as I'm doing this from home, um, which I'm very happy to do, I might say. But greetings to all from the, the South Pacific region where it's uh, currently no. uh, about uh, 10 minutes to six in, in the morning. Um, I have a technical maneuver to accomplish yeah, actually, actually, actually. now. I'm about to share my screen to get the PowerPoint. And then I'll perform the complicated technical maneuver, I hope, of going full screen. Uh, while she's doing that, let me just that. try to remind, if, uh, uh, while she's doing that, I can just remind everyone to please mute yourself if you're not already muted. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Right. Okay. Is that clear now? Has that come full screen? Uh, excellent. Okay. Lovely. Well, that's me. Um, and um, that's where you'll find my, uh, uh, my documentation if you want to, to follow uh, anything up. Thank you, Julian, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm going to start uh, with um, this uh, project that, that I have been working on off and on, I guess, for the uh, best part of 30 years. That is the critique, or well, maybe even more, the critique of mainstream sociology, but particularly the, the critique of sociology's understanding of its history. Um, this part of my work uh, really took shape uh, when I was teaching in another uh, uh, US university and was given the task of teaching the uh, classical theory course, uh, some, uh, a term that I had uh, by and large managed to avoid or evade up to that point in, in my career. And of course, classical theory principally meant uh, these gentlemen, uh, so uh, which under some acquaintance with their work was regarded as a necessary part of the professional preparation uh, of a sociologist, especially someone who's going to teach uh, sociology. Um, and I was a little uh, confronted by this because um, I didn't think this was uh, a, a good understanding. Uh, way of understanding history. I didn't believe in the great man theory of history and so forth. So in that course, we actually explored alternative ways of thinking about the history of sociology, thinking about a people's history of sociology and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, in exchange for an essay on Weber, which I demanded from my students, uh, I wrote for them an essay which they were uh, asked to mark uh, about why we should not be studying classical theory as then understood um, and began to treat this story of the, the three founding fathers as, a, as more a kind of creation myth uh, than a real history and then wondering what was the function of this myth, why had it come in, what did it do? to the way sociological agendas were, were constructed. Um, now, at that time, sociology was, um, I'm, I'm talk, talking about a generation ago now, um, was largely understood as a study of modern societies, contrasted with 
history, there's the study of past societies and anthropology is the study of primitive societies. And that I think does relate to, to this way of, of understanding the history of the discipline. Because if you go back to the first couple of generations of uh, academic sociologists, that sociology was formed as, a, um, as an academic discipline in the last couple of decades of the 19th century Christian era and the first uh, decade of the, of the 20th. Um, the, the, the leading feature of the way, I mean, different sociologists had different accounts of, of, of uh, the science and the, uh, the nature of society. But what they very largely shared um, was the idea that you could uh, distinguish you know, social experience uh, across the world and through history, through a contrast, which I call the, the concept of global difference between the modern and the primitive. And for many of them, this was understood through an evolutionary model of society. Um, so we often now think of that as, as evolutionary sociology and regard that as, as, as very old fashioned uh, indeed. Um, but if we think more sociologically about it, um, we have to ask then what, uh, what were the circumstances in which that way of thinking about societies arose, uh, made any kind of sense uh, at all. And the answer to that seemed to me uh, to be that the sociologists were located in the centers of imperial power, pretty much at the high tide of Western imperialism, of European, North American, Russian imperialism at the end of the 19th century was pretty much the, the peak uh, of European global power. Um, and you can see that this uh, idea of a science of society organized around a concept of global difference uh, provided a powerful way of understanding the social relations of empire, but a way that was exculpatory, a way that excused, if you like, the, the violence, theft, um, and, and horror that was spreading on a global scale uh, at this very time, and which, of course, the intelligentsia of the Global Centre did know about. Um, but what is really striking, I think, is that this notion of global difference, of modernity versus the primitive or earlier stages of social evolution, did persist and has persisted into much more contemporary theory within professional sociology. So if you look at the work of Tony Giddens, for instance, for whom I have a lot of respect, uh, nevertheless, in his great, um, uh, his great work on the constitution of society, he speaks about modernity in terms not of a continuous um, history uh, with other forms of society. He's not an evolutionist, but he talks in terms of massive discontinuities between the modern and other social forms or social formations, as I would speak of them. So he sees a break, not a relationship, in effect, between the colonizers and the colonized. And that seems to me a very telling uh, feature of, of uh, Know, more contemporary social theory, as well as the, uh, the founding generations. Now, Australia, um, where I live and where I got my uh, initial academic training, um, came late to the party in terms of academic sociology. So academic sociology was created in Australia basically in the 1950s and 60s. And it basically took over this view of what sociology was about. That is, it was uh, a, a science of modernity contrasted with um, uh, other form, social forms um, which were um, uh, in, in some way or other outside the scope of what sociology was about rather than in a relationship to it. Even though we had a colonized population, indigenous people on the continent with the, the settler population so um, 
uh, Australian sociology was constructed, in effect, within this framework. And Australia, at least settler colonial society in Australia, we didn't have that terminology then, um, was basically understood as an, as an instance of modernity, um, as something like uh, 51st state of the United States or a lost county of England or a, 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 an extra department of France. So that the natural procedure for Australian sociologists was to do empirical research here, uh, borrow the intellectual frameworks from um, the United States or Europe, which at that time uh, generally meant either Parsonian functionalism uh, or uh, Lasfeldian empiricism. Um, and this was true even of very good uh, sociologists. I'm not here criticizing people. So the woman in the center of this picture, uh, Jean Martin, who's not very well known outside Australia, uh, was the most brilliant sociologist of the founding generation in Australia. Uh, she's she shown here in her first uh, role as, and indeed last role, as chair of a, a sociology department. She set up what became the biggest sociology department in Australia. This is her among the other senior professors of the new university, uh, La Trobe University, where she worked. Um, and her natural um, uh, frame of reference, if you like, in the, the work that she did on ethnicity, on migration, on refugee settlers was a great book. Um, was her na natural frame of reference was to compare with um, you know, similar kinds of intellectual projects in the United States, in Britain or in other parts, parts of Europe. So for uh, you know, the creation, I'm offering this as a kind of example of the formation of sociology in another uh, area of the world outside the global metropole. Nevertheless, the, the, the natural framework was provided by the thinkers of, of the metropole. Um, and this didn't, um, uh, if you like, require uh, any particular um, sociological critique of the theory that came from the global metropole. It was just assumed to be universally relevant, which was, of course, the way that Northern theorists presented it. Uh, their, their work uh, to the academic world. And this is something that I critique um, recently, uh, elaborately in, uh, in, in the book Julian was kind enough to mention, Southern Theory, where I look uh, at uh, several of the most uh, celebrated uh, Northern theorists, uh, theorists from the global North uh, at the time that I was uh, uh, writing this. Uh, whose work, it seemed to me, is characterized by a number of intellectual moves for which we can give now uh, give a, a sociological critique, that, including that claim of universality, the claim that theory generated in the conditions of the global north should be relevant to, to any uh, other uh, you know, contemporary society. Um, it struck me also that uh, Northern theory was characterized by a move which I called reading from the center, uh, which is taking the social experience of the Society of Europe and North America as the logical basis uh, of constructing social theory, for instance, the understanding of time and social change as, as continuous rather than disjunctive. Um, the uh, what I call the gestures of exclusion, that is the way the citation practices, the reading practices of sociological thinkers in the global north, which never included um, the uh, intellectual work uh, that came from the uh, Islamic world, from South Asia, from uh, other parts of, of the world. And, and what I call the, the gesture of grand erasure, um, which basically um, obliterated the experience of colonialism uh, from the, the purview of, of uh, sociological theory. 
Now that, uh, that critique that I've just rather drastically summarized um, um, was forming in my mind as I, I worked on, uh, on my teaching tasks and, and began to write up these ideas. Uh, and having got a, a, a conceptual um, um, line of march, uh, if you like, uh, being a good empirical sociologist, I began looking for the data. Um, the, the theory told me that there must be other ways of thinking about society, uh, other frameworks, other projects. So I began looking for them. And um, that uh, took a considerable time. It took me about 14 years to, to, uh, to write this book, uh, in, in most of which I was quite deliberately looking for alternative uh, ways, alternative um, uh, groups of, of thinkers uh, whose social experience was different from that of the Northern theorists that I was uh, already familiar with. Um, and that brought me to uh, eventually to uh, some incredibly impressive thinkers, uh, people like, for instance, like Bina Agarwal, uh, Indian uh, development uh, economics, uh, researcher, socialist, feminist, ecological thinker, uh, a, a wonderful uh, researcher and a truly important uh, modern theorist in social sciences, people like Ashit Mbembe, um, who I'm sure uh, some of you know his stunning work on the post-colony, it's written a generation ago, um, his more uh, recent book, The Critique of Black Reason, um, his work on necropolitics, again, a, a stunning oeuvre of work of the absolutely highest quality and relevance to the contemporary world, um, and, and many more, uh, as you see in the book. Now, of course, I wasn't the only person who had these ideas um, and was thinking about uh, these kinds of questions, people like Farid Alatas, whom you hear later in the in the series, uh, Joao Maia in uh, in Brazil, now a colleague and, and friend, um, uh, all of them uh, sort of beginning to surface and put into uh, circulation uh, in the academic social sciences resources and perspectives that um, um, you know had effectively been been excluded from sociological theory before and I think that's a tremendously important and, and creative uh, approach now I want to move on from that point um, and from expressing my a uh, tremendous appreciation for what Julian is, is doing in, in this series, which seems to be really, really important uh, to put these perspectives and, and issues into wider circulation. I want to think a little bit about what's involved in, in placing sociology specifically in its epistemological and institutional context. Um, and um, if you don't mind my a little bit of self-advertising. Um, my latest account of this is in this book, uh, which came out just a couple of years ago, um, um, uh, published by, by Z Books. Um, and in that, I, I have a chapter devoted to what I call the global economy of knowledge, which tries to combine an epistemological and a, an institutional perspective on the, on the construction of the research-based knowledge formation that, that includes sociology. Now, the you know, fundamental point about this economy is that it's been created over something like a 500 year period of history, uh, the period of European overseas expansion and the creation of the modern global economy, a uh, period marked as we're now uh, thoroughly aware uh, by the creation of a massive uh, uh, transatlantic slave trade, by the invention of the, the, the modern concept of race and the creation of racist social regimes, by um, ex creation of extractivist economies on a, on a massive scale, 
by the creation of settler colonies, such as the early uh, colonies of colonization of North America and the more recent colonization of Australia. Um, in other words, we're, we're looking at uh, knowledge in the context of the formation of new social orders on a global scale. Um, the process which in Australia, um, although we didn't learn this in school, nevertheless involved a violent occupation of indigenous uh, lands and a, a, a effectively a genocidal uh, approach to the original inhabitants of, of the continent. Um, we, um, the, um, one of the, the, the crucial features um, of the uh, colonial societies that were created through this process, both colonies of settlement and colonies of conquest, um, was what uh, Aníbal Quijano, um, a sociologist from Peru, uh, has called the, the coloniality of power. That's a, a concept that's often misunderstood. Um, to me, the, the core of it is Quijano's argument about institutions. He argues that the institutions of the colonial state were created in uh, an essential relationship with the imperial center. Uh, so that all the institutions set up by the colonial state, including missionary religion, economic um, uh, exploitation and so forth, had this structure of relationship to an imperial center. That's what he calls the coloniality of power. And as the history of Latin America very clearly shows, this is a relationship that can survive formal independence, even wars of independence, and is now, of course, uh, reconstructed as the foundation of the contemporary global economy. Now, an absolutely crucial thing, I think, for the sociology of knowledge, including the sociology of sociology, is that the coloniality of power involves knowledge institutions as well as the state and economic institutions. So it involves universities, research institutes, um, data collection, and so on and so forth. In effect, the colonized world, and now the post-colonial world, uh, became an enormous data mine for the knowledge institutions of the imperial center. And that was initially an informal relationship as colonizers sent back reports of their experience and what they found to the global center, um, you know, writing to the, the King of Spain, the Queen of England or whatever about what was out there, what they'd run into, and of course, sending back specimens. But in time, it became a very systematic process. And it's something that I think is very much underplayed in our understandings of the history and sociology of science. But it did happen on a massive scale and involving very significant figures in the history of the sciences, natural sciences, as well as social sciences. This is a picture of one moment in that process. Uh, this is a a British naval vessel called the Beagle. And those of you who recognize the name will know who was on board, a young uh, natural scientist by the name of Charles Darwin. Uh, this ship sailed for three years around the colonial and post-colonial, the waters of the colonial and post-colonial world doing geological, biological, astronomical observations. Uh, came back to England with a, a load, an enormous load of data, and 20 years later out popped the origin of species. In other words, it was an experience quite uh, important for the development of modern biology. And you can tell similar stories for other, many other fields of science, including the social sciences, including sociology. So if you look at the actual teaching texts that were written by that first generation of uh, sociologists in the United States and in Western Europe, you will find it loaded with the data uh, that came for, comes from empire, with social data uh, that came back from this uh, data collecting and, and reporting process. Uh, 
And thus the, the economy of knowledge that was created during the, um, the, the high tide of, of imperialism, the 18th and 19th centuries, embedded in it a relationship between parts of the world and groups of intellectual workers who were sources of data and the institutions in the global metropole in the imperial center which accumulated this data thought about it developed concepts and methodologies and eventually transformed uh, this into organized disciplinary sciences as we know them now today and developed also applied sciences by applying this, this work to practical problems. And in that form, the knowledge was then re-exported to the colonized and post-colonial world. And we got a reproduction of the sciences as shaped in Northern institutions in around other parts of the world, for instance, the story I told you about Australia. So, <coughs> There, uh, these um, stories, you know, I'm telling you about Darwin 150, 200 years ago, um, but this is still going on. If you look at the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for instance, you'll see the same relationships. A vast amount of the data on which contemporary climate science is built uh, comes from the Global South or the atmosphere uh, above the Global South. But the intellectual framework, the concepts, the methodologies, and in this case, of course, the uh, computer models um, basically come from the global north where the data is, is principally accumulated. Now, these relationships um, came into focus for me uh, through the work of a very important West African philosopher, Pauline Nuntonji, it's one of my intellectual heroes. Um, who developed an analysis of um, partly modeled on Samir Amin's analysis of the global capitalist economy, uh, but um, and didn't actually use the phrase global economy of knowledge, I think, but that's what he was talking about. Um, and he, it was, who uh, offered an account uh, of uh, intellectual work, uh, which for the first time, I guess, gave me a, a real understanding of my own situation because uh, it was Suntanji who argued that given this global structure, um, the attitude of intellectual workers in the periphery, and he was thinking mainly of Africa, but this also applies in Australia, was one of being oriented to intellectual authority that comes from outside your own immediate society. Uh, in this case, the institutions of the global north. He called this uh, attitude extroversion. And, and that is characteristic of uh, the social sciences, indeed the natural sciences too, in parts of the world outside the, the global north. Um, so out of this you know, whole economy, it flows of, of knowledge and concepts come the, the, the kinds of hierarchies that we're now very familiar with when people do league tables of journals in sociology, for instance, here's one example. Um, it's hardly surprising given this underlying structure that 19 out of 20 of the top journals in sociology are published in the United States and the other one is published in Britain. Um, the institutional basis of uh, uh, this e economy um, involves uh, the spread, the creation of a, a, a um, global university system, now a mass institution involving something like 200 million students. Um, Research institutes um, in the global north, but also spreading into other parts of the world so that uh, the Soviet Union, uh, China, uh, after the revolution set up its research institutes basically on the French model. Um, the development of a global workforce such as we, we see represented though unequally in organizations like the International Sociological Association. <clears throat> 
But in the creation of a, a, an integrated economy of this kind, something very deeply important happens. And that is, as Julian mentioned in his introduction to the series, an exclusion of a, um, what I call gestures of exclusion, uh, which applies to powerful alternative universalisms, such as Islamic sciences. Um, it applies to indigenous, place-based indigenous knowledges. Um, <clears throat> and um, which, which are not obliterated as, uh, as knowledge formations, but are simply excluded from what is taken to be uh, proper uh, science, in this case, proper social science. And here, I think, is the enormous importance of, of the work of people like Farid Alatas in showing the depth of the tradition of social science in the Islamic world. Um, in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, here is the importance of indigenous knowledge projects. Um, this is an important Australian contribution about the significance of land um, in knowledge and society for uh, Aboriginal Australians. Um, and I could go on and through the, um, through the series, uh, you will encounter more examples of the kinds of knowledge and, frameworks that have not become part of the, the central um, you know, intellectual apparatus of sociology. Okay, well, I want to finish this, this presentation uh, with a little bit more optimism, because <laughs> one can get depressed uh, about the scale of exclusions, about the, the you know, Eurocentrism, the sheer racism, uh, of a lot of, of our tradition um, and about the difficulty of changing the institutional relationships that underpin uh, these intellectual patterns. But there is more to the story. Um, the global economy of knowledge is not static. It's dynamic in various ways, just as research-based knowledge itself is, is dynamic. Um, this is something we tried to pick up um, in a recent project I've been involved in with colleagues uh, in Australia, uh, in Brazil, and in South Africa, uh, looking at new fields of knowledge and how the creation of new fields of knowledge, the ones we studied were AIDS research, uh, gender studies, and climate change, uh, how these might affect the, uh, under the, the, the pattern of relationships between intellectual workers in the global periphery in this case, the a group of countries that uh, I, I call the Southern Tier countries who uh, are not third world countries, who have well-developed university systems, uh, but who are still peripheral uh, in relation to North America and, and Western Europe. Um, we were actually looking to see if uh, Northern hegemony in the production of research-based knowledge uh, was shaken uh, by the creation of new fields of knowledge. Well, it wasn't as simple as that, of course, when you got into the empirical detail. We, we did some institution ethnography and quite a lot of interviews with uh, researchers in these fields. But we certainly found it more complicated than a simple pattern of Northern dominance and Southern subordination. It wasn't like that. Um, in fact, we found a number of processes going on, which I'll, I'll summarize very quickly. Firstly, the hegemony of the North was being reproduced. Uh, that is one of the processes that happens. A lot of uh, leading uh, you know, uh, researchers in new fields in the Southern tier had been trained in the Global North and gone for their PhDs to places like Chicago. Um, they all went to conferences um, many of them depended on funding from the Global North and to get funding from the Global North, you have to speak the conceptual and institutional language of the Global North. Many of them used intellectual frameworks that had been formulated in the institutions of the Global North. But that reproduction was only one of the things that was going on. Another thing was the questioning of the hegemony of the Global North. Uh, for instance, in the AIDS field, where South Africa is a very, very important player, 
uh, in the production of knowledge, the capacities uh, of knowledge workers in the Southern tier were rising, had been rising over the history of this, this field of knowledge. And we could see a pattern of, in, of negotiating relationships with researchers in the global north that increasingly came uh, from a position of strength uh, rather than weakness. We also saw a pattern where the hegemony of the North was in a sense displaced um, through the importance of what we came to call local knowledges. Uh, for instance, in relation to climate change work, the knowledge and experience of local groups of forestry workers was actually quite an important source of, of knowledge for researchers um, in, in the South in this field or the social practices of healing in uh, relation to the HIV AIDS epidemic uh, were also a significant um, uh, source of, of, of knowledge for of research based knowledge because here the communities impacted are in effect the data and communities generate their own understandings and knowledge too. And finally, there are practices where um, the hegemony of the North is simply contested and inverted, uh, if you like, by claiming hegemony and, uh, and control uh, for communities and knowledge workers in uh, the periphery, in the global South. And here I want to mention the work of an Indigenous sociologist in Australia, this colleague of mine, uh, Maggie Walter. Uh, co-author of a book called Indigenous Statistics, which I uh, um, uh, strongly recommend uh, to anyone with, who's not really terrified by statistics and even to some who are, uh, and who would like to uh, see how uh, Indigenous knowledges are by no means fixed in the past, uh, but involve contemporary problems and, and developments of, of new techniques. Maggie's work revolves especially around the concept of data sovereignty, of rights and control and uses of information relating to Indigenous communities, uh, which uh, data sovereignty effectively, uh, though quietly, uh, being claimed by the imperial powers at the time of colonization, is now being contested from below. And that is, I think, a really important uh, development. So with all of these different processes going on, the global economy of knowledge is, is a much livelier and more varied place than a simple model of Northern dominance uh, might, might lead us to think. In fact, I, I think we are at an exciting moment um, in sociology and indeed in, in other fields of knowledge. Some of the ground has been cleared. Um, <coughs> as Julian suggested in, in thinking about in, in speaking about the premise in which this lecture series has been constructed, there are new possibilities. There are other possibilities. Um, to my mind, a, a, a world social science is possible. It's hard to build, but it is possible. And um, some of the, the optimism of, um, you know, <coughs> anti-globalization and, um, world democratization movements is legitimate uh, in intellectual work too. So where I've uh, argued and still argue for seeing the history of uh, research-based knowledge not as a case of uh, culture-bound Western science, but as a story of imperial science involving data and concept flows between different parts of the world. I would see the history of uh, research-based knowledge now as, as <coughs> imperial science rather than Western science. Um, and I would argue now that we could regard that as, if you like, world social science uh, mark one. And we now want world social science mark two where the residues of imperialism and global inequality are contested and in the long run overcome and a democratic framework, an inclusive framework 
um, for intellectual work uh, becomes normal. That's my hope. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, a wonderful presentation, um, wonderful exposition of, so, of some very provocative ideas. Um, and so uh, thank you so much. Uh, we do have time and uh, it's wonderful uh, if, if Professor Connell is uh, willing to stay on for a while. Um, sure. Thank you. Um, so uh, the way I wanna do questions is if you can please put your name in the chat directly to me, I can start a queue and then I can call on you and unmute you when your turn comes. Um, I would like to um, make sure that students get priority in their questions. There's something of a Chicago tradition here where students get first dibs on questions. So if you are a student, please note that in the chat and I'll prioritize you. And definitely students, please um, uh, put your questions together for me. So again, if you wanna ask a question, please uh, send your uh, name to me in the, in, in, in the chat um, and um, I will start collecting names. Um, uh, and so as, as uh, people are getting their thoughts together, um, I did wanna maybe just, um, ask one question and I'll just put it out there and, and either Professor Connell can answer it now or save it for later. But one question um, that uh, I've been thinking about and hearing about is this um, tension in our project of, of, of heading for a world social science, as you put it, that is more democratic and inclusive, a tension between on the one hand, the, 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 the true desire to be inclusive and participatory, and on the other hand, the, the status of the sociologist as the expert. Um, which we really can't escape um, in as much as we are sociologists. Um, and so, you know, maybe we can just put it off to think about, or Professor Connor, you can uh, maybe address that, your thoughts on that um, as questions come up. But um, uh, again, the, it's just a question about, you know, where, where, where do we as social scientists, as experts, you know, how do, how do we fit in and deal with that tension uh, between trying to create a more inclusive, open, um, knowledge production system um, and yet claiming some kind of expertise. Um, so let me, I have a, a queue going on and I first have um, a question from uh, Yushen Yang. Um, and let me just then uh, unmute uh, Yushen. Uh, let me get there unless, uh, let's see here. Um, yes, I think you're unmuted, go ahead. Hi, uh, Professor Connell, thank you so much for this amazing talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, my question is about um, the idea of Northern theory versus Southern theory is um, in your work, both on Southern theory and on your work on gender and masculinities, you also draw upon uh, Gramsci's theory of hegemony. And you use the word hegemony a couple of times during the talk. So I'm very curious, uh, what do you think about um, how, in what ways should we be using those Northern theories? And also in your work, you have been very critical about Bourdieu's social theory uh, for its focus on reproduction. But some scholars have also noted that Bourdieu's idea of symbolic violence, symbolic domination shares a lot of similarities with the Gramsci's idea of uh, hegemony. So I'm also kind of curious about whether you think the idea of symbolic uh, symbolic domination can help us understand the kind of domination of Northern theory in sociology. Mm. Um, that's a very interesting question. How many hours do we have for this session, Julian? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, um, officially, officially we have till 4.15, but uh, uh, yeah, go for uh, it. Yes, I know it's a long, but you don't uh, have to drop it. <laughs> I, I might need a second cup of coffee for, uh, for, for this one. Uh, Yushin, that's, uh, I, I have um, a, 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 a a complicated history, I suppose, in uh, of interaction with, with Gramsci's ideas. Um, uh, I first uh, became um, aware of Gramsci's work actually back in the 1960s when it began to circulate a little in um, left-wing circles in Australia. I was part of the, the student movement uh, at the time when this began to happen. And uh, it seemed then um, 
that uh, it was extremely, uh, Gramsci's account of uh, intellectuals and uh, cultural domination, which is the way that the idea was understood in Australia, uh, was extremely illuminating for our own situation in Australia. So I was at that time performing the same kind of operation uh, that I described earlier in the formation of, of sociology, that I was taking an authoritative framework which came to us from the global north, and there is a little issue about Gramsci himself there, uh, <clears throat> which I'll come back to in a moment, and applying it to my own society um, and finding you know, the, the illumination in it. Um, what was different, I suppose, was that with Gramsci, because he was a you know, socialist activist, uh, not an academic uh, theorist, uh, it was actually an agenda of struggle. Uh, it, it, um, not just a, uh, uh, an academic reflection on social relations. So it seemed uh, important to us in validating certain kinds of, um, of projects, such as the creation of radical knowledge projects, knowledge centers, uh, working with unions and working class communities and trying to break down the the isolation of intellectual workers. All of that was authorized by the way Gramsci theorized this kind of thing. Um, I was also uh, intrigued and um, uh, uh, began to study Lukács uh, at the same time, Georg Lukács, um, who uh, seemed to me to theorize somewhat related questions though in a very different way and in some ways in a more intellectually complex and sophisticated way than Gramsci had done, but rather less convincingly in terms of its action consequences. So that's why I got involved with, with Gramsci's work um, and with that uh, development that in, in Europe came to be called the development of Western Marxism or cultural Marxist uh, theory. Um, and in a, a, a much uh, uh, bolder step, I suppose, uh, a little later, I began applying these kinds of ideas in another field, that is gender analysis. Uh, and so began thinking about how hegemony might work in, in the structures of gender relations. That led to the concept of hegemonic masculinity, which became a kind of slogan for the new masculinity studies in a strange way. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Gramsci's work has been extremely important to me and I, I uh, have rather, um, I, I have been criticized and doubtless correctly criticized for playing fast and loose with <laughs> Gramsci's ideas um, and not being rigorous enough in, in seeing its Hegelian roots and its, its embedding in a, a formal Marxist um, uh, framework. Well, I don't care about that, actually. I, you know, I'm happy, you know, if I can pick up a useful tool from any part of the woodshed, I will use it. Um, and if that helps people understand what's going on, uh, well and good. And um, if, uh, you know, it's interesting to see the, the background and roots of these concepts, but um, when you're you know, confronting urgent problems in the social world, it actually doesn't matter where the tools come from if they are helpful to you and other people in grasping what's going on and acting in a situation. And, and that brings me actually to Julian's question. Um, so I want to say something about that. Uh, I think there is, um, Julian is right, there is a tension between our need for expertise as social scientists and a democratic uh, project or an intention to use uh, to, to have social science be a democratic undertaking. There is a tension there, that's quite right. And for me, the way to work on that tension, you, you don't abolish that tension, you can't wish it away. <clears throat> it's there, it, it will be there. But the, for me, the fruitful way to think about that is to ask who is the audience for our work? When we use our expertise to analyze a situation, uh, who are we talking to? Um, 
um, who are we trying to serve if we think that intellectual workers should serve the people? Um, who are we trying to serve and how do we do that? So the audience of our writing is actually a key question. Um, and uh, there, I think <coughs> uh, the way we train uh, sociologists in, in graduate school uh, is in, in many ways counterproductive because we effectively train them to talk to other professionals, to other sociologists. Uh, we encourage them to publish in the most prestigious disciplinary um, journals. We, we, we teach them how to do that uh, quite carefully, but we don't necessarily um, put the same energy into teaching them how to speak sociologically to audiences outside the profession. Now, in, in my case, because uh, a significant part of my work has been um, uh, in, in the sociology of education, uh, I have had a natural audience outside academic life, that is school teachers. So um, I have tried to, to speak to teachers, to work with teachers, to go to their conferences, read their, their journals, understand their, their uh, labor process, the changes in their situation and so on and so forth, and make the intellectual labor relevant to that audience and to set up uh, opportunities for them to critique it and, and tell me in what ways it is and isn't isn't relevant. And another part of my work where I've worked on, uh, as Julian mentioned, I've done a fair bit of work on class structure, class relations. I've had an audience in the labour movement and I've been involved in the labour movement myself, involved in, in unions, been on strike and so forth. Um, and, and making the knowledge intelligible and useful uh, to a non-academic audience is therefore a, a, an important part of my practice. Sometimes it's worked, sometimes it hasn't, but it's at any rate something I've cons consistently tried to do. Um, so those are the, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm suggesting practical ways of getting into those, those questions, not just intellectual ways in effect. Yeah. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, we have a few more. I think what I would suggest is maybe we take two at a time, if that's okay, um, just to make sure that everyone gets a chance. Um, and then, like I said, uh, students or otherwise, if you want to ask a question, just put, send me a, a message in chat directly and I'll, I'll, get, I'll put you on the queue. So for now, I have, I'm going to go with the next two. I have Patrick Levine and then Anne Rule. So Patrick Levine, please, who uh, uh, I think you should be able to unmute yourself. If not, let me know. Yes. Thank you, Julian. Hi, Raywin. Um, it's an <laughs> honor to get to be able to ask you a question. I'm a huge fan of a lot of your literature. Um, so I have two questions and hopefully they're not um, too nerve wracking. Um, since you are the one of the linchpin scholars of masculinity, I wonder what do you think of the sort of a westernization of sociology as a sort of masculinizing project? Um, I think one scholar who might speak against that would be Franz, Franz Fanon. He's one of the few uh, people who might have something to say within the area, but I'm curious if to see if you have any commentary, um, especially because I'm interested in the studies of subordinate masculinities, which I think is one area of study which is vastly sort of not even thought of as a really much a, a legitimate thing. Um, another question I kind of wanted to bring up is, you know, I keep hearing a lot of people talking about the westernization of sociology. Yes, it's western, it's west. It's like, well, okay, yeah, we keep talking about that, but who, who, who's going to be of the canon if we were to create a new canon of scholars that were not western scholars, who would those people be? Because I don't usually hear much talk about, well, who could we bring in to the sort of canon of Western scholarship or the, the, I guess, of Western circles of scholarship or into sociology in general, that's not of a Western scholar. Like who would those, who would that, who would that constitute if you were to change the canon around? Thank you. And um, we'll, we'll try to get one more um, before uh, Professor Connell's response. And that's from Anne Rule, if you can unmute yourself, please. It's Anne Ruel. Um, Anne Ruel, yes, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much for being here with us. I um, have also like used your work really widely. Um, so one of my questions, kind of, it's I think it'll it'll be related to to Patrick's. Like, what are your recommendations for students trying to incorporate more Southern theory into their work? Um, in my work, I 
in in El Salvador, like I can search in Spanish online and like one of, I think in, in, in Southern Theory, you mentioned like I'm still limited to the works that have been translated to English and that, you know, like have still reached a certain prestige and that they've been published and all these things. So there's still quite a, a bit that's left out and kind of how you think about navigating some of the ways that the knowledge gets to us by the time it gets to us. Um, and another, sorry, I'm gonna do two, but we can do, I've got, it's, it's, there are two of many. Um, another one in, in thinking about the language when we were talking about like Western theory and Northern theory versus Southern theory, the metropole periphery. Um, I kind of wonder sometimes like, would it, if like, should we be assigning racial labels to those rather than saying like North, South, whatever? Like, it seems like a lot of times those are kind of euphemisms for, for like glo global structures of white supremacy. And so why the choice not to assign ra racial labels? Thanks. Okay. Um, I, uh, coming back to, it was uh, Patrick, was it the, the um, uh, first of those questions? Um, kind of starting with the, the question whether we can see the, the construction of, um, of sociology as a masculinizing project. Uh, in a sense, that's right. Uh, the, the first generations of um, professional, if you like, academic uh, sociologists were indeed overwhelmingly men. Um, significant number of their students, I think, were women from an early stage. Um, I, I have no uh, evidence, clear evidence of that, but the, the discipline was being created at the time when uh, women's access, at least middle-class women's access to higher education was rising quite significantly. Um, and most of those uh, uh, students went into the humanities and social sciences rather than areas uh, like uh, engineering uh, or, or physics. Uh, so it's at least plausible that, that a significant number of their students were women. Uh, and there is indeed in, in the history of sociology in Chicago a certain discussion of the gender patterns of the, the male professors at the University of Chicago and the women at Hull House uh, being in a, a certain tension with each other. Um, so um, there, there, there was a, um, a presence of women in the knowledge project in a relatively marginalized position from early on, I think. Um, by a later generation, uh, people, if you remember that photograph I showed you of Jean Martin, the, one of the first generation sociologists in Australia, women could uh, by the 1960s uh, occupy a, you know, a quite important institutional position uh, in sociology and that at least uh, began to undermine the, the cultural masculinization of the discourse and, and the institutions. And of course, at that time also, uh, we began to get the women's liberation critique of the academic project in general, uh, the development of women's studies, explosion of research on gender, a good part of which happened in sociology. Um, and and the, the, the power relations, the gendered power relations in sociology began to shift quite rapidly in, in that generation. Uh, but it's very interesting and it's not all that much discussed. So it's, it's well worth thinking through, especially when you think on a world scale, how much uh, colonization was a gendered project. Uh, empire was a gendered project. It was run by men. The, the workforce of colonization was basically men. Um, but the impact, of course, was, was on women uh, as much as, as on, on men. Um, the second, second question you, you posed was to do with the um, the, the westernization of, of the canon. Now, uh, if you were listening carefully to my talk, uh, you might have noticed that I never used the word westernization. I hope I didn't use the word western at all. Um, 
And that's a very deliberate choice. I don't talk about, uh, except in inverted commas, uh, perhaps I did in the implicit inverted commas, talk about Western science uh, and something else. What, Eastern science? Well, it's not quite right for Africa. It's not quite right for Latin America. Um, uh, basically, the reason I don't use that terminology is that that tends to suggest a culturalist interpretation of knowledge, uh, which I think is very limited uh, in, in its power. Um, and understanding the institutional um, underpinnings of the cultural practices of knowledge formation uh, gives us a much stronger um, uh, intellectual uh, uh, approach to the problems of the global, what we might call the global sociology of knowledge. Um, in terms of looking for a new canon, well, I'm, I'm not keen on the idea of a canon anyway, that is an authorized set of uh, intellectual figures who become culture heroes and, and, and authorities. Uh, I'm in favor of regarding a, a wide range of <clears throat> thinkers as resources um, and their ideas as tools which we can use um, when, when they're appropriate. Um, in, in that respect, uh, the title of my book, Southern Theory, was a little unfortunate. Um, because it, it, it has led some people to think I was trying to create a new canon um, or that I was trying to suggest there is one alternative, a Southern theory that we can contrast with Northern in the way that cultural interpretations uh, contrast Western culture with Eastern culture in the, the good old Max Weber style. Um, and, and that those are procedures that I definitely do not recommend. I don't want to, to fall into that, that kind of pattern. Um, but I, I, I use the title Southern Theory, uh, meaning um, to designate a field in which we could go searching for, for intellectual resources. Um, and um, <clears throat> And that's a very, that's a vast field. I mean, it embraces the, the majority of the world's population. Um, there's enormous differences of wealth, uh, resources, tradition, cultures, and so forth uh, in that category. Um, and uh, I, I therefore, um, you know, heartily uh, endorse any argument for the diversity of situations um, that provide alternatives to uh, 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 an authorized uh, uh, Eurocentric canon uh, as an intellectual framework for, for sociology. I mean, I will even go so far as to find intellectual resources in Bourdieu uh, at times, uh, as one must in the sociology of education, which is one of the areas where he made quite important uh, contributions. Um, uh, coming to, to Anne's um, uh, question about how uh, we can access and incorporate um, Southern theories, um, that's, that's a very practical question, one that I've had some advantages in because being you know, an established academic and able to travel um, at, from a rich country because uh, Australia is peripheral but rich. Um, we have a colonial economy, but one that is in fact uh, supports a, 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 a very well uh, uh, resourced uh, university system. So I've, I've been very privileged in, in that respect. I've been able to travel. Um, so a good part of my research for Southern Theory was done in secondhand bookshops in other countries. Uh, or uh, over co in coffee shops uh, around universities in different parts of the world where I would sit down with the local colleagues and say, who should I read? You know, who are the important um, uh, thinkers in local traditions? Tell me who to read and show me where I can get their work. Uh, 
Um, so I would come home from trips to, to conferences or to give lectures here and there, you know, with my luggage groaning with unread uh, books that I never heard of before that I then had to try to, to understand through the fog of, of imperfectly understood languages and, and I'm, uh, you know, have a modest knowledge of, of, of several languages, but not really good knowledge of any language except English. So I too relied a lot on translation. And that, uh, of course, is an immense problem because then you're dependent on, you know, publishers who thought such and such uh, work was important enough to translate. Uh, uh, translation is an expensive process, at least in the past. Um, it was. Um, on the other hand, you know, going to other parts of the world, and I was able to travel a bit to South Asia, a good deal to East and Southeast Asia, uh, a little bit to Southern Africa and a bit to Latin America. Um, I could get locally published work. Um, so, so get onto the email and uh, become pen friends with people in other global regions and ask them to send you secondhand books. Um, now there's a research technology that I don't think it's ever been, been uh, taught, uh, but try it. Um, that's the way to do it. Search online, um, uh, make friends with people who are fluent in another language and appoint them unpaid, uh, but very honored research assistants. Um, and, and you can do that, you know, if you have a, a dissertation project in mind, for instance, or you're underway in a dissertation project, you can narrow that process a good deal to people who work in sociology around questions of education, who should I read? Um, well, we know about Paolo Freire, uh, but who else do we know uh, from the Global South who's an important figure in educational thought? In fact, there's this, you know, tremendous traditions of interesting educational thought in many parts of the world uh, that are not currently used in the sociology of education, but who could be. Um, so um, there you go. And the same kind of thing in, in every other field of sociology, I think. Uh, racial labels, um, uh, sometimes uh, some people have criticized um, Southern theory um, for uh, its, its non-engagement uh, with uh, issues of racial analysis. I think that's a fair criticism It underplays those issues. I mean, they're present there to some extent. Um, uh, for instance, in my discussion of, of the so-called African philosophy, um, but uh, that's, that's a fair criticism. It's also a fair criticism that the, the story told in Southern theory is, is, um, is gendered. Uh, it's mainly about blokes. Uh, that's also a fair criticism. And it reflects the, the kind of thing I was doing of uh, uh, you know, looking for established intellectual traditions in different parts of the world where the societies were patriarchal, that approach will mainly throw out men some uh, women uh, are in the book, but it is legitimately criticized on those grounds. So I've been working since then on repairing at least that side of it and uh, finding a, you know, a, an incredibly rich history of feminist thought and gender analysis in colonial and post-colonial societies. Um, and I'm very interested in what uh, in the, the recent discussion uh, around Du Bois, uh, for instance, what has been surfacing about the history of thought about race. Um, I mean, it's, it's undoubtedly the case that some of the, that first generation of professional sociology um, was deeply racist in its way of thinking about global difference and empire. Um, and some of the consequences that I think have flowed through into contemporary sociology's ways of engaging with modernity. Um, so um, I guess that's, that's what I can say there. That if I were doing it again now, uh, rather than you know, 20 or 25 years ago, uh, both gender and race would be more prominent in the story, I think. Excellent, thank you so much. So um, officially we still have a, a few more minutes and I have two more questions. So if, uh, if, we, if we may, 
Professor Connell, take two more and then we'll close it sure. off with that. Thank you. Um, so I have, um, let's take them in order. So I'll have uh, Yuswan um, and then uh, Nikhil. Okay, thank you. So I've been following your, your book, which I think is pretty well written. And towards the end, because we have been talking about this for a few classes now, so I'm quite engaged in your discussion on what's, how to theorize once we have this knowledge of not to commit to the originalization of so-called Western canon. So my question would be that, would, would be like, what can we actually view Western texts and to, and to see that how some of them might be an inspiration for us when it comes to sterilizing. Because for example, you mentioned Gramsci as your influence and Gramsci was special in a way that like he was not really a direct, he, he was not a theoretical or a scholar. He was more like a, he, he, he was a, uh, he, 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 he was, he has this political agenda He's, and he was trying to overthrow this government, uh, overthrow the capitalist government. For, so he wasn't really a scholar in the sense. And he didn't commit himself to sterilizing. Instead, he committed himself to this to civil movement. And another example I was thinking about was Tocqueville, because Tocqueville, even, even though he was re, he's really treated as a philosopher by the West today, he was actually more like a, tourist slash reflecting, re reflective journalist who traveled in the United States and wrote this book called Marx in America. So this is my first question, whether we could draw inspirations from maybe these three authors. And the second question is about this idea in Solid Theory about the dispute between explanations and descriptions because, um, because after engaging with your work, I'm curious that whether you, you have heard about this dispute between whether social science should be a descriptive or more explanatory enterprise. Or maybe you would step back and say that, oh, this kind of division is more like a Western, so Western canon construct. So I'm curious about what you think of this divide that's been going on, especially in the last century, the end of last century. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, on, on your first thought, um, yes, um, I, I have no, I, I don't feel that we should ban the Western canon. I mean, again, I, I don't usually use that term uh, because it suggests a, a culturalist interpretation of the dominant knowledge formation as something that was exclusively produced in the West. And my argument is that it was produced in relationship to the colonised and post-colonial world, that there were data flows and concept flows um, uh, so that it, it's the, the knowledge formation is better understood as a product of empire rather than as a simple product of Western culture. So that that's, uh, would, would be my first thought. Um, then uh, I, I would say, uh, I, I, in no sense would I want to ban <laughs> the products of uh, Global North institutions, the intellectual products of Global North institutions as a resource. I, I, I'm, 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 you know, have constantly used um, uh, work coming out of the Global North in my own research and, and thinking. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong in doing that or, or shameful. Uh, my, my argument is for not for uh, downplaying uh, what resources we can get from the global north, but for expanding uh, the range of resources we can get in, uh, on a vast scale uh, through the rest of the, of the world. And that will, um, that will lead us not only to figures who are well known in Europe, but bear in mind that, that Gramsci was not um, you're quite right, he was a political activist um, writing for, writing engaged work for, uh, you know, a potentially large audience rather than an academic thinker writing for a professional, professional audience. Um, <clears throat> but he did become part of a, an academic canon in, in a way, and that was how I came to know him through, through that circuit. Uh, but there are other figures, including one who's in, in some ways an interesting parallel to Gramsci, that is Mariatagui, uh, 
from Peru, who is a contemporary of Gramsci, also a communist, um, and also a cultural theorist, an extremely interesting guy, uh, who was one of the first uh, communist thinkers of any quality to engage with colonialism and to write about the situation of indigenous people and try to theorize them in Marxist terms, which is something Gramsci never did. And, um, um, so, um, uh, but Mariategui certainly regarded himself as a Marxist. So he was using the framework from the North, but doing highly original and, and interesting things with it. Uh, but never got recognized in the North as a significant social thinker. So there's an example of the, the way we can enrich um, our uh, intellectual resources from you know, already existing um, uh, materials. On the question of the, the contrast between explanation and, and description, um, I... I uh, I don't. Um, I don't think I have any very profound things to to say about that. Uh, both of those seem to be necessary parts uh, of a, a, an intellectual project, of an intellectual process. Um, and here I'd refer you uh, again to the um, uh, the book my book, The Good University, particularly the opening chapter of that, where I talk about the nature of research um, and, uh, and particularly offer a kind of sociological labor process analysis of the formation of disciplinary knowledge um, in which a moment of theory and a moment of engagement with data sources are seen as phases or moments, better moments in uh, an integrated labor process of knowledge production. So I don't really see those as, as opposed goals um, for sociology, but as best understood as different moments in an intellectual labor process that will, will produce uh, organized knowledge. Great, thank you. And, and if we have, we have one more uh, from Nikhil and then we will close it out. Nikhil, please. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Professor Conan, uh, for doing all the important works. Um, so my question is um, like, do you think that without, without uh, restructuring the economic relationship between the global South countries and global North countries, it is possible to materialize the proposals that you or other scholars are um, making. You know, given that, you know, most of the publishing outlets where you publish are affiliated with or controlled by elite institutions or elite, elite publishing companies. And also like, you know, I think another increasing uh, tendency in Western academic atmosphere is the uh, obsession with the positivist paradigm. Um, because it goes along with the logic of the market. Uh, so my again question is, do you think without restructuring the economic relationship between the global North and the global South, it is possible to materialize what you are proposing? Some of it, but not much. Um, I, I, I agree with your, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the importance of the, of the issue that, that you're raising. Um, the economy of knowledge can be analytically separated from the material economy of goods, goods and services, but not very far. Um, and uh, they're obviously dependent on uh, each other. Um, so the, um, uh, I, uh, you know, am, am highly aware uh, that the patterns of centrality and marginality in the economy of knowledge uh, reflect, they don't exactly map, um, but in, in many ways they reflect the inequalities, the huge inequalities of the global material economy. Interestingly, that was also in Tonji's view um, in, in developing the picture of 
the construction of knowledge, which, which I have built on. Uh, Hindonji uh, based his arguments very largely on the economic analysis uh, of Samir Amin, uh, who is an Egyptian Marxist economist uh, of you know, great importance in, in contemporary development economic thought. Um, so um, that, that, that connection, if you like, has been implicit uh, in the arguments about the global economy of knowledge uh, very much from the start. And uh, you're right also, I think, in bringing up the, the significance of the market ideology, the rise of a, a market ideology in the last generation uh, for the reconstruction of knowledge institutions. And again, I'm sorry to keep flogging this. This is something that I do talk about in, in The Good University, um, which looks at the institutional changes that have been happening uh, in the global university system and within universities as institutions. Um, other people have been looking at other aspects of this, and I will mention someone else's work, you'll be glad to know. Um, it, there is a famous article, I, I can't for the moment remember the, the names of the authors, uh, but the article is easy to find. A few years ago in the open access journal PLOS One, which is the most famous new open access journal. And the article looked at the concentration of ownership in the publishing industry on a world scale as they affected academic journals and found that there were five corporations, transnational corporations, which accounted for 50% of the journal public, of the, the journal articles published in all the natural sciences, five corporations. That's the degree of concentration of, of power and uh, control in the natural sciences. And in the social sciences, humanities, five corporations also accounted for half of the, uh, the journal articles published across the world. Um, and uh, four corporations are on both lists. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, amount of you know power and control that is in the hands of a small group of of uh, northern they're all northern global north corporations of course uh, is, is stunning uh, and I don't believe that that has been reversed since that article appeared a, a few years ago I think that is still very much the case which is the reason of course why um, profit making corporations. Uh, you know, place uh, most of their journals behind paywalls or find other ways of extracting money by charging authors fees to make their, uh, their work open access. Um, therefore, um, you know, very large amounts of uh, our discipline sociology as well as other disciplines are now behind paywalls. And that means, of course, uh, you know, uh, people outside privileged academic institutions have great difficulty accessing that knowledge. There are ways to work around this, of course, and there are struggles over, um, um, <coughs> you know, uh, 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 attempts to liberate um, inf information that is currently behind paywalls. Sci-Hub is probably the most famous. Um, but there are other uh, 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 ways of doing that and other attempts to do it. Um, so there are, if you like, democratization struggles going on in the system at the moment. It's one of the things that gives me hope. I mean, I'm, I'm a complete klutz online. I can't do this kind of stuff, but I immensely admire people who do and, and who are carrying on these struggles, if you like, in the heartland of corporate control uh, over knowledge. That's, that's tremendously inspiring. So if any of you are doing that kind of work, uh, more power to your elbow and get on with it. Uh, and please let me know about it. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then uh, we do have to shut down, uh, but look at, I have two concluding 
points. Um, first of all, just a reminder, on April 29th, Bedora Alagra will speak on Cedric Robinson and Sylvia Winter as part of the series. Um, two theorists um, who are potentially uh, worth including in this, in this discussion of Southern theory, definitely, I think. Um, and so if you're interested, please join us and please read along. You know, my class, we're reading um, Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism and some works by Winter. Read along with us and, and come join us on April 29th. Um, and secondly, of course, I want to thank Professor Connell. You know, for those of you uh, who don't know, again, I, I, I just keep in mind, uh, Professor Connell's retired. She's emerita. She doesn't need to be doing this stuff. She's well advanced in her career, so there's no emotion, uh, there's no promotional value for this. You know, it's it's just pure intellectual generosity, and I really want to thank her so much for joining us today. And I hope you can uh, join me in, in thanking her as well. And um, we hope to uh, see you all and, and, and see her um, many times to come. So thank you all okay. for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Raywin. Um, we'll see you. I'll get back in touch. Thank you.